what your textbook would call as a typical accidental entrepreneur. This means that between all the Madras stereotypes and the filter coffee, I was sort of in a Tambram family that wanted me to do one thing and one thing really well. Excel with that report card so that they can rub it inside their neighbor's face. Right? <laughs> Practically what we wanted to start off with. <clears throat> so conveniently then, my life around school to engineering undergrad between Chennai and Bangalore really revolved around three things. Classes, creative ways to bunk these classes, and then the samosas in the canteen. Right? So it, it's sort of surprising how years can fly by only this way. It took me a while to realize that. The first time that I did have that sort of a quick reality check was the first time I was strutting into my internship. It's sort of that exciting phase, isn't it, when you come into engineering, which is, oh, these are the four weeks of holidays I get. Let me go and work it off again. Right? So I got started during my undergrad at uh, a Silicon Valley giant, uh, a chip design firm. Because they conveniently decided Bangalore is cheaper for talent and hence set up an R&D center here, basically. Right? So that was day one. I decided to wear my dad's oversized formal shoes because for some reason I thought it's a good idea. Then strutted into this office. I sort of walked in and uh, in my mind, I'm sort of racing. I'm like, dude, a week ago you were struggling to answer a four marker on inductors. And now you're potentially going to be designing something which is going to be used in millions of devices. Like, who are you kidding? Right? So, and it's almost at moments like these when you have a typical reality check that happens. It's almost like a storybook sucker punch that comes to you. I didn't design any chips. I didn't make any silicon to begin with. I was fetching cups of tea for my manager from the vending machine. Right? <laughs> this is how I got started. Now, it taught me a valuable lesson. It actually left me with something, which was, I was hungry. I was actually ambitious to be more meaningful, to have better impact than 30 yards between that fat guy and the vending machine. Right? I, I wanted to be more. So I went back home, and like any sane person will do, I binged watched The Social Network. Like, you, we all need that little bit of motivation now, no? I binge watched it thrice, I think. Right? So I used that, and uh, that was sort of motivation enough for me to walk through the rest of my internship, where I began to moonlight on something. What do I mean by moonlighting? Moonlighting is sort of this nice way of putting it out saying you have a nine to five and then from five to say another X number of hours in the day, I decide to work on something more. So when I began to moonlight on something, it was sort of really a culmination of curiosity, which was, hey, what can I do to sort of impact or have an impact on the system of education? Because one shy fat kid in, uh, who's 18 years old can apparently solve the entire system problems that we have. No? But this naivety that we have when we get started, right? the lack of knowns or the lack of knowledge about these variables is a blessing in disguise. Because it allows us to answer some of these larger questions that we always want to go out there and do. So I put together a small team, two other guys, and I build out this product. Uh, it was in a field called adaptive learning. So I take this product and I walk in straight to my first business meeting. Right? So I'm sitting across the table to this 70-year-old school administrator. And he's sort of looking with squinty eyes right back at me, almost with disbelief. And he says, son, you're almost as old as a kid who comes in to take an admission form. And 2,000 of these drop into my institution every year. You're telling me that you and that piece of software that you've written is going to do my job better than me overnight. I was like, yeah, like that, that's the purpose. But so he, he really didn't buy it. Eventually, we went on to power more than 12,000 of those kids who came into that institution. So it sort of leaves you thinking, doesn't it? It really leaves you thinking about very profound things that happen through this journey that we take. The one thing which I realized was, constantly I found the difference between learning and education. Right? It's, it almost seemed as if all the learning happened outside these four walls. My classrooms could never prepare me for these meetings I took, the products I built, the things that I chased. So the learning happened outside, but seemingly 
the education happens to be inside these four walls. And that disconnect was pressing, right? And uh, that sort of kept me going, right? It kept the curiosity or the drive or the zealous passion to go about doing something further and further. And we sort of scorned for making mistakes back in through the entire system of learning, is, don't we? I remember the days when I used to be at electronics labs and uh, I used to, by mistake, burn this 10 paisa ka resistor. And that lab attendant, if looks can kill, right, he's, he will give me that one death stare that will possibly like, like torch me out. But unlike labs and controlled environments, the real world entrepreneurship life and anything that you do relies on the fact that you will make mistakes. You will not be good at it when you begin. You will slip up. That is the necessary design of learning something. And it takes a while, right? So whatever you do, unlike a three hour graded paper, keeps it real. Right? It is very different from what you go through in that moment. I did go into Stanford Graduate School of Business, not because I can do my integrals and differentials well, but because I was curious. Right? I was curious to go out there and build something. Curiosity is a funny term, because curiosity fuels ambition. Right? What do I mean by ambition then? Ambition is sort of a very selfish thing here, yeah, let me be honest about that, which is, it is these small set of goals, things that we want to do, we are the heroes of our own stories, and the things that we want to achieve as we move forward. Now, these bits of ambition can be short term, like getting out of the stock, or can be slightly more long term if you're an engineering undergrad, which is getting out of the institution, right? So, ambition inherently fuels us, it inherently drives us, and this ambition over a period of time, when you're chasing something that you really like, is what you're passionate about inherently, right? So go chase that piece that you're curious, you then drive and develop an ambition for, and then you're passionate about. So again, big fancy words, right? What does this really look like? In the field of entrepreneurship, you might be imagining there's this white male stereotype with pin-up coats who walks into a conference room with big wide wooden tables and signs seemingly important papers. Right? But what does it really look like? In all honesty, it, it looks way more to be multiple cups of coffee a day, a shabby desk that you call as your office slash workspace, and perhaps 80 hour work weeks. And if you're lucky, a team of more people to share this misery with you. So in reality, things are different. You go through the grind, you go through the necessary motions of getting better at something. Now, when that begins off with, <coughs> it's sort of important to keep in mind what got you started. The piece of curiosity that helps drive and take things forward. Now, having said that, where does entrepreneurship really fit into this ecosystem? And that's where I'm very passionate, or I believe strongly, in technology. Right? Technology literally is eating this world and making it a better place. This is for the first time, the epicenter of power in the whole world is not at Wall Street, it's at Silicon Valley. Right? And each one of you have a big part to play in that as we move forward in our times. And that got me curious, right? which was sitting in front of a computer, I am able to generate something which can possibly change the world. And that's an empowering feeling. So what can we do to sort of contribute to this sphere of technology? And that's really where my curiosity began, which was, hey, I want to own the shiniest gadgets out there. And what do I need to do to get started? Right? And this curiosity then fueled what I was ambitious about, which was a one-way flight ticket to San Francisco. Right? Let's, let's keep it simple. That, that's, that's really what was the short-term ambition that we were looking for. And then you sort of go forward and forward where this ambition develops into a passion, which was, hey, what can I do in this, in this behemoth that I look at? And where can I put a dent in the field of technology? And where can I involve myself in this process? And that's a question that I'm still trying to answer today. That's, that's a question that I'm still trying to look at as a tech guy, an entrepreneur, and someone who cares a damn about building stuff. That's it. 
So in my current format, the, what I work on is something that I want to help you visualize. So close your eyes for a moment and think of the most interesting things that you've done. Say probably go on a hike recently, go to an entirely new country, a meaningful moment that you perhaps shared with family, etc. What do you feel? It's all about the sights, sounds, the things you saw, felt, heard, touched. It's all sensory things, aren't they? Now this is a big part of what makes us human. It's a big part of what constitutes us. Now what if we can relive or go through each one of these sights and sounds just the way they were, sitting right here? That's the promise of two technologies that we call as virtual and augmented reality. Right? The ability to strap you right here where you just put on nothing more than dorky looking goggles at the moment and you're sort of transported into these entirely new worlds. Worlds that help bring anything to you in an augmented sense or take you into entirely new spaces in the virtual reality sense. But very often, we talk about technology almost like it's a black box, right? Which is uh, difficult to get into and get started. Now, more often than not, tech is intimidating beyond the local authors and foreign authors that we tend to look at. Right? And it doesn't have to be that way. And that's really where we got started. With Scapic, what we're really building out is a dead simple way for each one of you here to build what you want in virtual and augmented reality to showcase out to everyone else. And it took me a while to really even push to this front. It took us about a year's worth of work in order to raise venture capital. But when we did, we were one of the youngest in the country to do so. It took me more than about two to three years to even get started. With, it, took, it took me about, about two to three years to learn from mistakes, do my, do my first two ventures, and really, really grow out of these experiences. But then, that taught me how to build good teams, what it takes in order to appreciate the people around you who share the same passion for what you go ahead and do. So, the necessary design of growing through something is by a process of evolution, right? You will learn, you will go through this motion. And I sort of want to pause here and sort of reflect back, which was out of the entire journey that I took here, right from where I got started to now, there was one thing that really didn't matter at all. That was that shiny report card back in the day what I got started with, right? So I want to quickly focus on something a bit more important. Lines. What do I mean by that, right? Wait, what do you mean lines are more important? And uh, that's sort of something that I want to dwell on, which is lines are a very fascinating concept. They are all around us, right? Some lines put you behind bars. Some lines make you wait. Some lines can be erased. Some lines you can't. I had a very visual way to run you through this, but uh, perhaps not. But what's important to understand is that the only lines that really matter are the boundaries you set yourself in your minds and the ones you leave behind. Right? So I'm more curious than ever to see how technology shapes the world around us. But I'm actually really even more curious than that to see the lines that each one of you get to make in the years to come. So go out there, do, learn, build, have your dreads, but by design, it's a very different way to learn than to be educated. So I want to leave you with a function of what it takes in order to get started. It really takes nothing more than a paper, piece of paper, the ideas that you have, and the passion that really drives you. I'm five years into this journey. I still seek answers. I still hope to get better. And I've learned more through each of my experiences than perhaps I have to offer. I'm sure that when you guys go out and have your tread, there are multiple things that you perhaps learn from and grow out of. So as we walk out of these rooms, it is perhaps some of the most exciting times that we live in across the spheres of tech and whatever it be. It can be a piece of art that you want to do, a composition that you want to complete with. But go out there, do it. On your marks, screw your marks, go. <laughs> Cheers.